Okay, let's finish this off by looking at the B-cell response or the antibody-mediated immunity. Keeping in mind that cell-mediated immunity and antibody-mediated immunity are typically being activated in parallel and they're uh, working at the same time, not necessarily in sequence. And we're going to see that the B-cells to be activated do need helper T-cells, but in a very different way. And the structure and timing and location and all that's pretty different from how the cytotoxic T-cells get activated. All right, so what are B cells? These are lymphocytes that produce antibodies. And an antibody, <clears throat> it turns out, is a B cell receptor that is secreted. So if go back to a couple of videos ago when we talked about the receptors. Look at that B cell receptor shaped like a letter Y with its tail embedded in the membrane on the surface of the B cell. When that B cell gets activated, it starts making more of that exact same B cell receptor, except it takes out a little um, hydrophobic tail uh, from the protein that locks it into the membrane so that as it's pushed to the membrane it just gets pushed all the way out and secreted. An active B cell can be producing uh, on the order of millions or billions of antibody molecules per second in secreting them. Very very effective at producing these molecules and at the end of this video I'll remind you of why antibodies are so important. Keep in mind how specific that B cell receptor is for a particular antigen and understand that the antibody that's secreted has that exact same high, high level of specificity. <clears throat> like T-cells, B-cells are first born, so to speak, in the bone marrow. They are uh, moved directly to the lymphoid organs, not to the thymus, and they undergo their clonal deletion and their maturation in the lymphoid organs and sometimes even a little bit in the bone marrow itself. And just like the T-cells, the helper and cytotoxic T-cells, they're going to camp out in those lymphoid organs until they're exposed to antigen, until antigen is brought to them. That antigen exposure is a little different, though. It's not brought to them on an antigen-presenting cell like it is with helper T-cells and cytotoxic T-cells. We'll see how that works <clears throat> in a minute. Remember that each B-cell has its own unique receptor that was randomly generated, so it's going to recognize a different puzzle piece. It's going to have the same diversity of puzzle pieces. It will have undergone clonal deletion, and so it shouldn't recognize and respond to any self-antigen. Activation of the B cell by antigen is going to lead to clonal expansion and differentiation, exactly like we saw with helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. We don't call <clears throat> an active B cell an effector B cell like we did with effector T cells. We call them plasma cells, and these are the ones that are going to be involved in the current battle by, secretion, by secreting huge quantities of antibodies specific to that antigen. And there'll also be a pool of memory B cells that are going to just hang back and be ready to be reactivated or activated for the secondary response if we're exposed to that exact same pathogen a week from now, a month from now, 20 years from now. <clears throat> so B cells are activated in, in, in a very similar manner to T cells in terms of how they respond to activation. How do they get activated? This is a little different. Rather than antigen being presented to them on an antigen-presenting cell in a lymph node or other lymphoid organ, the entire intact antigen bumps into the B cell. Now your lymph ducts, your lymphatic vessels, are constantly sampling the extracellular fluids of all your tissues. And that material that's in them does pass through all of these lymphoid organs. If during that sampling, a, a virus or a bacterium or some non-self eukaryote finds its way into that lymph duct, it's going to actually have to pass through the lymphoid organs, including uh, exposing itself to all these naive B cells. If one of these naive B cells <clears throat> with its Y-shaped B cell receptor all over the surface happens to bind tightly to it because it recognized a little piece of a flagellum or a capsular polysaccharide, or a capsomere on the surface of a, a virus, for example. It's going to respond. How's it going to respond, though? It's actually going to take it in. It's going to ingest it, phagocytose it. It's going to phagocytose it. It's going to digest it and then present all the fragments on MHC. So the B cell will actually consume. It'll, it'll phagocytose pathogen and represent the antigen. Who's it presenting it to? Who does antigen get presented to? First it gets presented to helper T cells. So then if a, a nearby helper T cell in the same lymphatic or lymphoid organ recognizes it, 
that help your T cells start secreting cytokines. Remember what cytokine does? Some of those cytokines will tell the helper T cell it needs to proliferate and differentiate. <clears throat> Some of those cytokines, however, are going to be taken up by the naive B cell and allow it to mature. When it matures, it differentiates and it will undergo uh, clonal expansion as well. So you end up with two pools. You've got your plasma cells that I drew in gray on the left here and a small pool of memory B cells. Memory B cells won't fight now, they won't produce antibody now, but they've got that same, um, that same B cell receptor. So if that antigen ever shows its face again, we can respond quickly. And the plasma cells are just going to start secreting huge, huge, huge quantities of antibody. So remember what antibody is good for. <clears throat> There's all the antibodies, little Y-shaped guys, because they are the B cell receptor, but in a soluble form. What are the antibodies do? We'll get to that on the next slide. Before we talk about the antibodies, I want to distinguish T-dependent antigens from T-independent antigens. What we just talked about was the B cell responds to T-dependent antigens, meaning that in order for the B cell to respond, to um, proliferate, differentiate, and begin secreting antibodies, which by the way it does right from the lymph node or other lymphoid organ. It doesn't, uh, doesn't need to travel anywhere. It can just sit there and secrete tons of antibodies from that location. Um, before it does that, it needs confirmation from a helper T cell that says, yeah, this antigen you're presenting to me looks like uh, it fits my T cell receptor. And since I graduated from um, school, that means it must be non-self and we better make some antibody against it. There are some antigens that are T independent of that. These are antigens that don't require cytokines or confirmation from a helper T cell in order to stimulate the B cell activation. These tend to be long polymers of repeating units. And so what happens with these long polymers, think about a long polysaccharide in a capsule, or a long flagellum of repeating proteins. They can activate, they can bind to multiple B cell receptors on the same cell at the same time. When that happens, you get a fast but weak and short-lived B cell response. Very little or no memory cells are formed, but that B cell can be induced to proliferate and start secreting a whole bunch of antibody right away. It's a way of shortcutting this long, slow step of waiting for a helper T cell to respond. Because that could take minutes to hours to even days before a helper T cell recognizes what that B cell is presenting. And in the meantime, the pathogen is growing, replicating, and making you sick. <clears throat> this T independent response is stunted in children and it doesn't develop until we get a little bit older, which is why some antigens like polysaccharide capsules, um, kids don't respond too well at all. They're very slow to respond. You and I, however, have this T independent response that can get um, at least some antibody cooking right away while we wait for a, the slower response from the helper T cell so that we can get some memory produced and so on. Because this T-independent response is stunted in kids, we have to be real strategic with some of our vaccines. Because the vaccine, the purpose of the vaccine, is to stimulate immunological memory against an antigen without ever having to see the live pathogen, without ever having to be sick. So for example, the Haemophilus influenza type B, or Hib vaccine, has to take this into account because Hib Haemophilus influenza type B has a capsular polysaccharide that kids can't recognize, and so they're very vulnerable to it. And uh, so what we can do is we can take that polysaccharide, we can conjugate it, link it to um, a good protein uh, that stimulates a good immune response, something like, um, like a, a tetanus um, protein, tetanus um, toxin protein, and we can actually stimulate a decent memory response in kids. <laughs> <clears throat> against the um, against the Hib polysaccharide, so it's a cool little strategy that takes into a, uh, account this T-independent antigen limitation that we see in children. Okay, we'll end this discussion by looking at some of the important things that we know that antibodies do. If you start in the uh, middle left, you see opsonization; they coat the antigen with antibody, and it enhances phagocytosis dramatically. Phagocytosis is so much more effective when the pathogen is opsonal. 
that optimization takes place specifically with antibodies and non-specifically with complement. But some other things can happen. I mentioned neutralization in one of the earlier videos. Um, viruses and bacteria have binding sites on them. Right? They have adhesins that let them stick to the appropriate tissue and then gain access to that tissue. If you can build antigens against those, <clears throat> those adhesins, you can block them from binding to your tissue. The pathogens drift around long enough, eventually phagocytes get them and clear them, and we can neutralize them. We can also neutralize toxins. A toxin's pretty darn small, but it needs to bind to some sort of receptor on a tissue and gain access to cause trouble. Right? If you remember, in, in many cases, a lot of these toxins cause trouble by blocking protein synthesis. If we can make antibodies against just the toxin alone, we can bind it up, block those active sites, block the binding sites of the toxin, and it just neutralizes it. It can only drift around until eventually uh, it gets phagocytosed. Um, they can increase inflammation locally. They can also, and this is important, agglutinate, which means clump things together to increase the effectiveness of phagocytosis. Remember, it's Y-shaped, an antibody is, and each antigen binding site at the ends of the Y are identical, which means, like you can see in this picture in the upper left, you can get the antibody, a single antibody molecule binding to an antigen on one pathogen and on a second and clump those two together. And by doing that, you can clump lots and lots of them together. And then when a macrophage comes along to gobble this up, it's not slowly eating one bacterial cell, let's say, at a time. It might eat five at a time, or 10 at a time, or even more, depending on how many of them have been agglutinated, cross-linked, by these Y-shaped antibodies. That is the B cell response. I want you to take some time to go through B cells and T cells, think about how they work together, Think about how the B cell response feeds back into and enhances innate immunity and how virtually every infection is going to rely to some degree on both of these types of lymphocytes.